Pleasure Coast. The views expressed on the following program are not necessarily those of WPSL. However, you're encouraged to like and share them on Facebook. Put on your thinking caps because you're going to be challenged tonight to think. You're going to need it because it's time for the African-American scene brought to you by Howard Insurance. Undergoing under uh, open enrollment right now. We'll give you a number a little later on in the show to call. But right now, here's the host of this awesome show, the one and only, Rudy Howard. Good evening, good evening, good evening. Always glad to be with you here on a Wednesday night. Well, fans, we're down to the last couple of weeks. Election will be a week from next Tuesday. So uh, I, for one... Like many of you, will be glad when this is over. This has just been really, 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 really rough. Well, in any event, tonight I'm going to have it wide open. You can call up and ask any question you want to ha- ask and uh, bring up any topic you want to bring up, and I will be glad to engage you. And if you have Medicare questions, you can call up and ask me about those as well. Uh, so we're leaving this wide open for you. But I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, did you hear about the Proud Boys have been in, uh, I think it's Brevard County. I'm not sure where the other county is. Sending people messages that if President Trump gets defeated, there's going to be issues. One of the things that that I've been hearing, and I kind of dismissed it, but I'm starting to think that it's probably true, more true than not true, is that period of time from the election until the inauguration is going to be a very uh, chaotic, uh, the potential to be a very chaotic period of time. because some people will uh, not want to accept the outcome. But, you know, I talked about this last week, and and I'm going to say it again. First off, what a lot of you don't understand is uh, black people as a whole are pretty conservative. What makes them not support the Republican Party is the social aspects that go to the extreme, which they just can't support, you know, even though they may agree with half of the positions that you you take. And that's just like, a, you know, you've heard me talk about this book I read, and, and it's, it's a really good book, What Color is a Conservative?, by J.C. Watts, as you, if you may recall, J.C. Watts was in a position of leadership in the Republican Party, and uh, former big-time quarterback from Oklahoma. And what he does in his book is he goes through and describes what it was like growing up, and tries to make the case that black folks in general are pretty conservative. And the separation between uh, Democrat and conservative is based on a few things. Now, for some of you, you you may find that hard to swallow, but uh, I I know people who are conservative for one reason and one reason only. Uh, uh, They're pro-life or let me correct that, they're pro-birth. Because most people that say they're pro-life are not pro-life, they're pro-birth. And there's a difference, a a, a tremendous difference. If you're pro-life, that doesn't stop when the baby comes out of the womb. That means you're pro-life 
for all life as it exists here on the planet. My pro-lifers tend to be protect the baby in the womb, and that is the extent of their pro-life. And to me, that's not pro-life, that's pro-birth. If you want to say you're pro-birth, okay, I'll accept that. Don't tell me you're pro-life, though, if, you're, if, you're, if you don't meet the qualifications for, for that. So, but I'm, I'm saying that there is a case, and, and, and one of the things I said last week is there's all these machinations to try and manipulate the vote. Totally unnecessary. The reason why all of those manipulations are engaged in is conservatives want to keep ideological purity. So in order to maintain their ideological purity, they have to find ways to win that does not make them compromise those fundamentals that conservatives say they believe in. Well, as long as you take that position, you're always going to be fighting an uphill battle because the vast majority of America is not conservative. I don't know how many times that you have to see it to, to understand it. Uh, <coughs> Trump did not win because the vast majority of people agreed with him. He won because of the Electoral College. And the Electoral College is outdated it's useless, and it needs to be done away with. And I said this last week, and, and I'm going to say it again tonight. When you think about it, from the time you first start school, elementary school, and they elect the captain of a team or uh, members of the school uh, you, you, student union, Majority rules. Majority rules when it comes to voting for a congressperson. Uh, majority rules when it comes to voting for a senator. The only time majority doesn't rule is when it comes to president and the electoral college rules. Now, my conservative friends want to keep the Electoral College because it tends to favor uh, conservatives. But I contend, and this is my very strong opinion about this, the Electoral College is part of what is causing us a great deal of division. If there was no Electoral College, you would have to win the hearts, minds, and souls of the American people in order to win the election. There would be no stopgap. There would be no escape loop. You would have to win the hearts and minds and souls of all American people to become president of the United States. And I'm sorry, that's the way it should be. <clears throat> there should not be some artificial mechanism like the Electoral College that is can come in and uh, award the presidency to a person who lost the popular vote. And uh, President Trump lost the popular vote by over three million votes. And he's president of the United States. There's something wrong with that picture. And uh, I, I think we, we need to change that. It, it, and for those of you who don't know, and, and forgive me, for those of you that I've told this to before, the Electoral College was created at the time that it was because there was limited ability to communicate. The telephone when it was, in, it was in its infancy. There was no internet. There was really no TV. Okay, so trying to make sure People were abreast of all the issues that were important in order to get 
a properly qualified candidate as president, they went with electors because the electors uh, would be more informed about uh, particulars of the candidates. You know what? That makes sense. And then back in 1787, that really makes sense. I have no ax to grind with that about trying to uh, make sure that the people are properly educated. But that doesn't apply to 2020. You got 24-hour TV, 24-hour news cycles. You can look at any kind of news you want. You can look at international news, national news, conservative news, liberal news. You have Internet. And, in, uh, and as a kid growing up, uh, I was fortunate enough, my parents bought those uh, encyclopedias and you'd try to find something that you're working on a report for, and you'd have to sit on the floor with those encyclopedias and go through and try to find that subject. You remember that, Cliff, right? Oh man! And you know, you you had to you you had to to rewrite your report. You couldn't word for word what you were looking up in the encyclopedia because they didn't know the teachers would know. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yep. And and now you can you can Google uh, and find stuff in like. 10 minutes. I, just about anything you want to know about, you can find in no more than a half an hour. Oh, yeah. Just doing an internet search. So people are informed. So the people don't need to be protected from themselves anymore. People are fully capable of getting the knowledge that they need t to vote for candidates that are running for office. The Electoral College has outlived its usefulness and needs to be done away with. And I know there's some of you out there that disagree with me, um, and I, I, I look forward to hearing your point of view. That's 340-1590. That's 340-1590. So, yes, uh, that's my, my opinion. And, and, I, and I strongly believe that uh, doing away with the Electoral College would really cut down a lot on our division. So, uh, Winnie, how are you? All right, how are you? Good. That's clear. Yeah, so far. Who, who created that? Uh, what president created that Electoral College? Uh, who, who created that? I don't remember the president. But I'm pretty sure it was created in 1787. So whoever, uh, uh. whoever the president was at that time, I think it was. And it wasn't just the president. I think it was uh, uh. the Congress itself created the Electoral College. And, and like I said, I think at that time it made some sense. Yeah. Now, uh, now they still it's out of date and they won't get rid of it. I think we're going to see it. I, I think that we will see it fall. I think they will get rid of it. To the objection of conservatives, but if, if, the, if the Senate flips, and I think there's a strong possibility that the Senate will flip, I think the Electoral College is going to go. Oh, that will be nice. Yeah, and so there's no so you, the third. you think it they should go, go too? They're going to go at it again later. Huh? They're going to do it again later. Uh, they're going to go by that toward the vote this November the 3rd. Yeah, well. This November the 3rd, they're going to go, go. We at don't it again. know. The, go. They're, they're uh, right now, I read an article today in The Atlantic. Uh, Oh. That they're trying to play some games with the Electoral College. Oh. And they want to try to override. Typically, the Electoral College members come from the state. And the they're governed by the popular vote of the state. Now, in the event that uh, there's a dispute about the popular vote in the state, the uh, state 
government has a right to appoint electors, which we have not seen done. But evidently, that's part of one of those rules that exists that has never been exercised, but they're looking at very strongly. So we'll see. Oh, uh, uh, that's good. That's great and everything. So, yeah, but that's good. So you voted? Yeah. Uh, I did, too. So uh, I don't care. You know, I say that's good. You know, Byron having one. That'd be a good history. You got to speak up. I can't hear you. <laughs> That'd be uh-huh. good, you know. That'd be good. Huh? You got to speak up. Oh, uh, by Harris Wood. That'd be good, you know. Uh, a bit history, hi- historical, and everything. Oh, they're right. They're going to have a debate tomorrow. Yes, they're going to have a debate tomorrow. Debate to- tomorrow. Uh, we'll be talking. Have a good night. Okay, thank you. Take Bye-bye. care. Bye-bye. And Trump's already complaining about the bait tomorrow night because the moderator is going to have the ability to shut his mic off. Oh, that's a cool ability for somebody to get to do, you know, because because <laughs> I get to do it. I get to do it all the time on this show. <laughs> I know you do. Yeah. <laughs> but in all fairness, if somebody hits you with a question and they don't let you answer it, that's about as rude as a human being can despicably get. Yeah. Ask a question and don't give you the chance to answer. That's, and and I thought when when they they were talking about putting that kill switch in there, and I thought I could do that. <laughs> you know, I've had experience at it. Yeah. But, well, I think you know one of the things that. Uh, I have discovered in the last three and a half years, and it started when I read that book about understanding the Constitution by Kim Weil, who's a uh, a legal professor. So many of the things that we thought were laws were not laws, they were norms. That every president, every Congress, every Senate, every house and every cent had agreed to. And some of them have been in effect for 100 years. So when he began to break those norms that some of us were, our hair was on fire because we thought he was probably breaking the law, but he wasn't. There's just things that typically the uh, government had preserved as a matter of decorum and a matter of courtesy and he uh, kind of threw them all out the door or stomped on them completely. So I think one of the things that has come out of the last uh, three and a half years is we're going to have to put some legislation in effect, to try to amp up uh, some of those uh, norms and make them become rules and laws. And we got Jeff on line one. Yes, sir. Hey, Rudy, I was just going to ask you, are you going to put a kill switch on the moderator, moderator too? I'm sorry? They're going to put a kill switch on the moderator too? Why would they put a kill switch on the moderator? I don't know, but that lady wouldn't let Ed Trump answer or any customer, any person. I'm sorry? Sitting there interrupting him the whole time. The last thing that they had, that town hall meeting. Oh, and they Jeff. Put a monitor, put a, uh, what do you call it on the monitor? Uh, well, Jeff, I don't know what debate you were looking at, but. The monitor uh, is supposed to lean anyway. I like the Jeff Dunham. But Rudy, I got debate. one question to you. You said something earlier about the black people, you know, doing this and doing that. I think I need Why would somebody vote for a guy that says this? Exactly what he says. If you don't vote for me, you're not black. I cannot believe that, that you stereotype you. Oh, no, no, no. That is the wrong thing to do. That was the wrong thing to say. I'll say that. Man, that's, it's that's an like, assumption. Woo, don't say something like that. Even I know better than that. I'm sort of stupid. Okay. <laughs> 
But anyway, have a great night. I just wanted to call and ask you about that because, you know, you talk about putting the kill switch on somebody. That maybe they should put one on the monitors, a guy that's handling the debate, because they seem to flap their jaws just as much as everybody. No, I don't think maybe. so. I, I think Chris Wallace is, uh, of all the people on Fox, uh, he's pretty much down the middle guy. Uh, I don't agree with him all the time, but he's as close to down the middle as as anybody on on that particular uh, channel. So I but don't think now you 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 don't agree with everybody all the time, or we wouldn't have a thing. And I always thought that electoral college was put into place because a bunch of farmers out in Wisconsin, who probably consists of one third of a of one hundred of a, a percentage of the vote wouldn't have an equal say versus a big city like New York or San Francisco or Chicago. No, that, but that's that not run, why. That city is pretty much going to have the word because obviously they're closer and low, you know, you know, I don't know. No, but it, but it, listen, you, we, at that point came up last week and, and I'm going to tell you, you can easily solve that problem. Every time you talk about the Electoral College, people talk about California and New York. It's easy to fix the problem. Easy. Come up with a platform and ideas that appeal to everybody. Then you'll get everybody's vote. If you no, don't, you you could do it. That's a mission impossible. There, Jesus Christ had a problem with that. <laughs> no, you could you you could do you could do that. You could. Oh. Listen, when when the Damn, Democrats when when the, when the when the Democrats when the black people went from Republican to Democrat, it's because the Democrats figured out in order to get the support of black people, they had to modify their position, and they did, and the the Dixiecrats that were left ran over to the Republican Party. You, it can be fixed, and 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 I'm so, saying, and I'm saying to you, and I believe this from the bottom of my heart, you would create more unity by eliminating the electoral college because then people would have to speak to everybody. The way it is now, you don't have to speak to everybody. Can well, you can you see that? Well. I don't see what you're saying. I mean, I give you credit on that one. Yeah, you're you're, you're in the ballpark. Okay. But, thank you, thank you, know, you. No, there's no problem. You're, you're a good man. I I I I listen to you constantly, but uh, I just don't agree with some of the things you say. And it's just you know, a little. I just you know, everybody seems to think that the black person should be a Democrat. Why? Do they need to be a Democrat, or why should they be a Democrat, or why should people be assuming they are a Democrat? Because they're not given the opportunity to choose themselves, or they choose themselves, but they're just so used to being Democrats. But has the Democratic Party done anything for the black man in the last 20 years? Oh, sure. <laughs> for sure. Have they? I mean, yes. I, don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm just asking you straight up. Can you tell me something that they've done? Because... Joe Biden voted against a lot of stuff that was for the black people. And I don't understand, again, if he voted against the civil rights bill, even if it was back in the day, I, I, I'm sorry. If we go back in the day, you know, everybody gets held accountable for, you know. But I'm just saying, you know, if he did all that, I mean, hmm. I, I, I would consider somebody else other than Joe Biden. He scares the living hell out of me. Oh, why are you afraid of Joe Biden? Are you kidding me? He's as, he a, he's a, a, look. He people, is a wolf in sheep's skin clothing, my friend. Well, what what what, what, do you, what do you what do you what are you afraid of? You are you afraid that he's too well, liberal? But first of all, him, him taking all that money. Why was he, him and his son taking all that money from those Joe countries? Biden didn't take the money. There's no proof that he took any money from sure anybody. Sure, he didn't. He did, his son did, and his son gives it. Some of it to his dad. Rudy, put it down on black and white on paper. How many homes does this man own? How many million plus dollar properties does he own on a $185,000 a year senator's salary? 
and probably a few extra little bonuses he picks up here and there. But think about, you know, some of his properties very, very elaborate. For the last eight years, the, the eight years you know, he was he was uh, he was vice president. He was making a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. Rudy, you make more money than that, and look look around. <laughs> Well, no. I, I wish that was true, but okay. Oh, Rudy. Talking but, to the... Okay, but it, hey, anyway, but it, the, 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 point of the, the point of the matter is that I have said, if you've listened to me for any length of time, I have said on here for the, almost the whole nine years that I've been on this show, doing this show, that Republicans could win black people support if they wouldn't do the stu- stupid stuff you do the stupid oh, you do you do the stupid yep. stuff and that just chases anybody that was going to be a supporter of yeah, of the well, republican party you do stupid stuff and it just runs them away right well here's the whole thing that gets me about our government this is what in a nutshell when you are having a political system where you got two when the presidential election gets elected, they're supposed to help each other. They're supposed to do things for each other, you know, try to help each other, you know, make the correct decisions. Bipartisan is the word I think they're supposed to use. Mm-hmm. Rudy, there's so much anti-bipartisanism in this country right now. All Nancy Pelosi's got to do is tweet out one thing, and I don't care what any other Democratic senator he says that they'll you know, they'll do what she wants. But, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's like, you know, why, what are they afraid of? What, 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 what's out there that, that, that is, is corrupted our government so bad that so many people are afraid that it's going to come out. And that's what got me a little concerned because there's something is underlying to create all this hate and all this anger, and there's got to be a reason. You know, I mean, you know, don't say it's Trump. This is this is long before Trump. Well, I I I'm will say, about, I, I, you know, I, I, is, is, is there honest people in 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 the government that don't take money from lobbyists and stuff like that? I mean, I know it, it's a practice. I mean, it, 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 it you know, you know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to let you go. I got another call. All right, my friend. Okay. okay. Hey, Jeff. All right. Jay, on line one. Yes, Jay, how are you, sir? Okay, good afternoon, Rudy. Good to, good to talk to you, man. Yeah. Uh, you, know, I, you know, I know I know you. everybody's at denial, you know, especially these uh, Trump uh, voters, because I work on a, on a poll. I'm a poll watcher, so I, I, I see it every day. Uh, they, 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 you know, it's just kind of sad. Uh, you're talking about, he was saying something about the, uh, Biden was 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 talking to a rapper, and uh, the rapper said he might vote for for, for Trump, and so you know he just got mad yes. and he, he yeah. had to keep his cool. But you know I hear Trump say all the time when he gets around, like he say, "What the hell do you have to lose? <laughs> you know, what, what do you black people have? What do you have to lose? You vote for me?" He said, "You ain't got nothing anyway. You don't have no job. You don't have no you know uh, you know you don't have no education. You don't have nothing. So you 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 know you don't have nothing to lose. You might as well vote for me." He says that every time he gets around a group about black people, but this character that you just had on, he wouldn't repeat that. Yeah, he he wouldn't repeat that. With you know, his with his God had to had to say, with Trump had to say, and the other thing is with all these so-called Christians. I heard today that 540, 545 children have been separated from their parents, and, they, and the parents don't even know where their kids are. These are the these are the people from. Uh, from, from south of the border, the Mexicans that we came coming over here looking for, uh, you know, looking to get away from violence and everything else, and so they so what Trump did to uh, to intimidate them from trying to come across the border. Well, we just take the kids away. Him and and, and so-called General Kelly. Now this is a guy that was a general in the Marine Corps, I believe, uh, leading me, leading thousands of men before he before he retired and went to you know join up with uh, with, with Trump, and he went along with this crap. He was his chief of staff when when it all started. And Stephen Miller, he's a, he's one of the white supremacists in the group. So <laughs> he got he's got a real uh, motley crew there around him, you know. And then you got Barr now. Barr is like uh, 
he was like the third rank. He was like the SS. You know, he's like the one of the, you know, like I was watching a German movie the other night on, 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 on TV, and it, it reminded me of Bob when I was watching the SS breaking into uh, the German, you know, Jewish people's houses in Germany during World War II. And it just, it just like it was like happening right now, it was as, as was happening then. It's almost the same repeat, same mindset. And it goes on. But yes, these are the people, that, these are the people they want in office. And, you know, they, they're just trying to, you know, they, they see that the country is changing. They don't want to see this change. So uh, they're coming out of the woodwork. They're crawling from underneath that rock, and uh, we got to learn how to deal with it. Well, I, I think what, that's, that's, I, I think part part of part of it, Jay, is yeah. I think there's a natural fear mm-hmm. of change, and and uh, I I think that's natural. It's like like it's like you know when we were kids and you played King of the Mountain. And when you were on top of the mountain and people were trying to get up the mountain, you know, you didn't want to give up the top of the mountain without uh, a scuffle. Well, I, I, I kind of understand. I'm not excusing it, but I kind of understand that there is apprehension about seeing the country change. And there's nothing they can do about it. Nothing. Nothing at all, no. Because in 2012, I just heard this statistic the other day, mm-hmm. 70% of the electorate was white. In 2020, 68% of the electorate is white. And it's going to go down, down, down. Now, in my humble opinion... What people should be trying to do is to do what you and I grew up had to do, mm-hmm. is figure out how I can be comfortable dealing with people who are different than me. Right. Not, not, not hard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Just first off, and, and, and uh, uh, Cliff will tell you, I've said this probably a thousand times, and you've probably heard me. If you get to know somebody that's different than you on a personal basis, more often than not, it will change some of your mindset if you allow that to be the governing factor rather than other people who are influencing you in your thinking. Yeah, right. If you're a reasonable, intelligent individual, and I know that's asking a lot for some people mm-hmm. but and you get to know somebody that's different than you and you say okay listen just like you pro- like when you were in Nam like when I went to sc- when I went to college I had a white mm-hmm. roommate I had never had a white roommate before mm-hmm. and so I had to he and I had to figure out who we were we both came from different backgrounds and uh my first one, I didn't get along with at all. And then my other roommate, I loved to death. I thought he was a fantastic guy. And that was education for me. I got a chance to know somebody that was different than me. And it changed. It had a, a profound impact on my own thinking. Yeah. So. You know, you, you know my change came when, I, like you said, when I was drafted and went into service. That kind of opened my eyes because then I was dealing with folks, you know, people who uh, as a matter of fact, you know, the drill, the drills, you know, when I was going with the training, the drills out and I those that most of them guys were Southerners. They were from like Texas or wherever. Yeah, that's right. You know, Alabama. So they didn't, you know, they still had, you know, they still had that thing in them, you know, that, uh, you know, the, the, they could talk to black, you know, black people the way they, you know, any way they want. And so being a drill sergeant, that even amplified with, you know, gave them more, you know, gave them more uh, authority, you know. So they, they were just getting off and calling us all kind of, you know, named them. Especially if you're from the city, any big city like Detroit, New York, oh, or whatever. Yeah. Oh man, they used to rag us to death, you know. But I learned how to deal with it. I learned how to because I knew I had to just, you know, keep them out so I couldn't say nothing. So I, and then after a while, once I got beyond that, and I start and I understood them. As a matter of fact, one of the drill, the drill sergeant kept me, you know, because I had to wait for my orders. It kept me about three weeks after, you know, after I was left, and I was there help. I was like an assistant, and so he kind of like, you know, he just liked the way I was. That I caught on and how quick I was able to adapt. And he said, You know, you can be a drill. I said, No, I don't want no parts of being a drill sergeant. I want to move on and go to tech school, you know, where I was supposed to go. 
yeah. communication. So he started laughing at me. He don't start laughing. He said, you don't want no parts of this. I said, no, sir. So, but that was my start of really getting myself together, learning how to deal with different races and different people, especially Southerners. Yeah. And uh, that was that was that was my uh, initiation. And and I, from that point on, I just whatever job I had, I just know how to deal with. Them. I just knew how exactly how to operate and and not get myself frustrated on, with nonsense. You have to. You ha- yeah. When when you are like you and I, who had to transition into yeah. that world. In order yeah. to be successful, you had to learn how. Yeah. Exactly. You know, and, and I bet you, you'd find a difficult time. I had one guy on here a few weeks ago who went to work at a black college in Ohio. But generally speaking, white guys don't have to go to an environment where it's all black people and learn how to adjust to be able to get along. Unless they're going to learn how to cook. Right. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, well, th- thank you, Jay. Always good okay, to hear from you. Okay, appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks a lot. You know, uh, come to come to think about it, you know, uh, I think back, and, and I know you'll remember this. So often they they say, you know, why black people need to pick themselves up by their bootstraps. Well, heck, man, when we were growing up, all the cooks... All the waiters at, were at the at the fancy clubs. Who were they, Cliff? Ooh, they were the successful black people. That's right. But they, they were cooks too. That's right. Wow. <laughs> boy, all, oh boy, oh boy! <laughs> all those, all those fancy places had black cooks in the back preparing the food. They're all gone now. Well, Gordon Ramsay kind of. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. You know, but yeah, just just you know, they that occupation, and uh, my uh, wife's godfather was one of those people that had grown up in that environment, and he always cooked all the fancy food, and that was pretty typical uh, when I was a young kid. All of those high end places had black chefs. Most people don't even know that. And and most of the waiters at those high-end places were all black. But now when, once it got clear that they could make a lot of money doing it, hmm. what happened, Cliff? Well, they, <laughs> they, they didn't fit into that stereotypical mindset that people put them in because, well, they're, they're starting to make some money now. I was just wondering, how do we explain Rudy? <laughs> Rudy makes good money. Rudy, Rudy's an insurance agent, you know. And and if they say black people don't raise their kids, that what happened to Rudy? <laughs> Rudy was a very successful father, raised a, a a man, a young man who's out there now, and he's making a difference. You know what it is, Rudy, is we confine ourselves to our box, to our comfort zone. Yes. We build hedges around ourselves and yes. our families and everything, and we think we're protecting them from what? Well, look at all the racism that's been out there. Is there rep- retribution for it out there? Some There's a little bit. There's a lot of folks that are still pretty angry about that. But uh, th- there's no sense in just putting yourself in a box of ideology because the box can be your prison just as well as it. I mean, you got to step outside that box. Every now and then. I know I mean. a guy that is basically a decent human being, very, very smart. He's in that box. He's locked in that box, and he can't get out. Mm-hmm. And he fights it when you, every now and then, I will say something to him that makes him have to look outside of the box, and he quick, fast shuts the the, the door on it right away. And it's but, only cardboard, uh, right? It's, it's not really a good confinement. I <laughs> cannot come out. I can't come out of this box. Let me be in my box because that's where I'm I'm comfortable. And this very intelligent man who may even be listening to me tonight knows there is no integrity in being in that box, but he has chosen that to be his place, and he stays there. 
and he won't come out. Even when you hit him with all kinds of information that shows him that what thinking that he has is faulty. And again, he's a very intelligent guy, so I know when I hit him with this stuff, he, he pauses, and then sometimes he'll just shut me off and not talk to me for weeks on end because I've just caused him so, so much anguish. <laughs> I've caused him so much anguish that uh, he just like, okay, uh, I, can't, I can't deal with that anymore. So but, once you get in areas of truth, it always hurts somebody. Yeah. yeah. It, it, you know what? I, I, I have said this a, a, a long time ago. And one of the hardest things, I think, for us as human beings is to look in the mirror and tell the truth about yourself. In other words, look in the mirror and face the problem. Yeah. Not, not many people can do that. They, you'll, you'll hear people say, well, I can do that. No, most people can't do that because they, they don't want to. They, they lack the ability to make a critical evaluation of themselves. Uh, to be able to say, you know, I'm pretty crappy at this, or I, I know I need to improve that. that we tend to try to avoid those things. Mm -hmm. I, and I think part of it is human nature, but I think the, the real strength that an individual can bring is when they can look in that mirror and say, okay, uh, there he is, and you need to fix ABC because <coughs> you're not very good at that. Or this is a, 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 a character flaw that you need to work at. Uh, pe people, aren't good, people aren't good at that. And, and, and you know what? The other part of that is to have friends that can tell you when you are off base or out of bounds. That's a, that's a very valuable, very valuable thing in one's life is when somebody that you know that cares about you can say, you know, you was a knucklehead about that. You, you don't need to do that anymore because that's just a really cr crappy thing you did. Uh, and if, if, if you believe and trust that person, then you can handle that. And then that can make you do some self-reflection. And then you can say, okay, I accept that from my friend, and I think I need to work on that. Well, there is one thing I have learned over the years, and it, it can apply to anybody. You know, you can... Uh, I, I get. I had this. I had this. This. This thought that just slipped on me. I hate it when that happens. But uh, you know, we're always we're, we're refusing to look in the mirror to see the problem because we think too highly of ourselves, and we're always right, and everybody else is always wrong. And and that's that's the box mentality. Because if you look carefully at the box, you'll notice that you're confined within. I mean, you can't get out. And uh, now some people couldn't beat them beat their way out of a wet paper bag. Uh, a, a cardboard box is not much different. <laughs> I mean, and uh, if that's what, what you're in. And that hedge that you build, it's too high. You, you make it so high that your own kids can't come through it for you sometimes. And sometimes it's that way with people. Families, look what happens when the parents pass away. A lot of families just go to, I mean, they, they, they fly south and don't come back. They, they're they split up most of the time afterwards. And it's all over little piddly things that they don't want to, you know, give up on their thought about. Uh, mine, 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 mine. <laughs> Have you ever heard that before? Yes. <laughs> I want mine. I want what's coming to me. You, do you really want what's coming to you? Well, let me tell you this. You deserve whatever's coming to you. You'll get what's coming to you. Trust me. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it, uh, unfortunately, I've, I've seen families break up over things that's yeah. uh that's really 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 unfortunate yeah but but yeah and and you know uh 
there is no reason for that because, after all, they're things. And, you know, uh, how valuable was your sister or brother if you let the things be the thing that allowed y'all to get separated? Doesn't make a lot of doesn't make a lot of sense, really. But I like what you said about the mirror guy, the guy in the mirror. Yeah. Because, you know, if we every once in a while, when we're in the mirror, instead of uh, admiring our good looks and things like that, we need to look into our own eyes and, and see what Ab- we're absolutely. Because that, that's absolutely. where a lot of the problems lie, and and I've noticed that with the drama that goes on with people. Some people just need drama to survive, and they conjure things up in their mind just to have some drama, and and there's a lot of that that's way out of way out of line. Yeah. Because you know what happens is everybody flows together; they all roll with the flow, and that's what they want everybody to do around them. And uh, and everybody doesn't roll with the flow. Some uh, some of those wheels are different shapes, like square wheels. They don't go as fast as the round ones. Absolutely. <laughs> the triangle wheels, and everybody's got their own wheel, but but still. We're all going in the same direction. Well, what, right. what we have to do is we we need to learn how to, you know, to help the guy next was having trouble with steering. Reach over there and grab that steering wheel on either side. Do a little bit of, of, of help. No real help. Not just telling everybody what they should think, but you show. Here here's that thought that I lost a while ago. You know, when you when you stop and, and you stop and think, and you and you look at yourself and consider yourself as possibly the problem. You might think that you have to change everybody. Remember this. You cannot change anybody, but you can change yourself. Yes. And that's the key. Change is the key. That's why they're afraid of change, because the box is going to melt away. They're not going to be confined anymore. And you know what? Uh, I think Snookhead soup is delicious. (laughs) That's soul food. (laughs) And I kid you not, I have never eaten anything that good before. (laughs) <laughs> I don't know if you've ever tried it. I don't know if it's an ingredient in there or what, but there's something euphoric about it. Were you talking mm-hmm. about sow soup? I'm talking about snookhead soup. Oh, oh snookhead soup. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, you see, in, in, in part of my growth, I, I bought a house years ago right next to a very popular uh, a black guy in our community. And, you know, I'd sit and talk with him. I always love talking to old black guys. It's always been my favorite thing to do. And when I'd sit and talk with this guy, one day he says, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you something, and you're going to love me. You're going to want to marry me after you taste this stuff. And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. What is it, snookhead soup, snookhead? Oh, come on. I'll be darned if it wasn't amazing. And I don't, I don't know anybody that's had it <laughs> that doesn't like it. And, and most people would go, ooh, snookhead soup, what are you talking about? Laugh. But you'll be surprised. <coughs> don't, be a, don't be afraid of, of other cultures and the things that they cook, because sometimes you'll taste something you've never tasted before. I, <coughs> fortunately, I, I kind of grew up in a household where uh, my father pretty much made you Try stuff. You couldn't say yeah, right. you couldn't say you didn't like it if you didn't try it. You have to have a little bit. And yeah, and then it, and I did the same thing with my son. <clears throat> and my son is not a picky eater. He will try almost anything. Yeah. Because he was just not, you know, kids now. You put the stuff down and you put it in front of me, and they go, "I'm not going to eat that." And you go, "Well, why?" Cause I don't like it. Well, how, never you, how do you know yeah. you don't like it? They you didn't even, you didn't you didn't taste it. <laughs> you know, I I never allowed him to do that. And and you know, I know parents that that do that, and it's wrong. It is. And I'm gonna say this, this is a this is not a, 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 just an opinion. That is absolutely wrong. To you stand up there and prepare a meal, sit it down in front of your kid. And they take a look at it and say, I'm not going to eat that. That's ridiculous. Yeah. That, that is absolutely ridiculous. Now, if they, and here was my, my, always my thing with, with, with my son. If you taste it and you don't like it, that's okay. I, I, can, I can deal with that. But 
Right. To, you to, just look at it and determine. Just look at it you know. and say, I'm not going to eat it? No, that's not That's not. Well, that's lie. what's going on in society. Somebody's going to look at me and they're going to say, I'm not going to talk to him. I don't, I don't like the way he looks. That's true. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of that going on. Of there. course it is. Yes. And, uh, we, we're, well, we're all learning from that every day. And I hope you're learning from listening to this show. Because this show is kind of designed to kind of, you know, open up your mind, clean the cobwebs out, and put some good stuff in every now and then. Stuff that you didn't know. Stuff that you couldn't even comprehend. You know. Yeah. Now, you know, it's funny. You, you said that I saw something on Facebook uh, today. And this guy had rented an Airbnb. If you know what Airbnb is. That's when people have private properties. They allow you to rent for Ru- you to oh, yeah. take vacation. Like if you had a beach house. Or yeah, something. yeah, you could do that. This guy rented this, and 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 my wife and I have talked about that. And I said, I'll never do Airbnb. She said, Why? I said, Because you don't know anything about the neighborhood, and you can go in that neighborhood, and you'd be an outcast in the neighborhood, and you would not know. And I, I don't want to take that chance. Well, it just so happens this guy, this black guy, rented this house and in this neighborhood, and he's sitting in the house, and this couple opens up the door and walks in and says, why are you here? Oh, no. <laughs> somebody scammed somebody into renting an apartment. It wasn't wasn't theirs to rent. No, it was. No, it was. But there was a it was a neighbor. Oh, who didn't un- didn't think that they belong there. Oh, what do you bet they called nine one one? I don't I don't. Think yeah, what so. did they report? Like that that gal in uh, Central, Central Park. Park. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, yeah. I'll yeah. show you nine one one. There's a black guy intimidating me. Yeah, right. You know? yeah. So yeah, I'm trying to. Yeah. Well, you know who who was it? Somebody passed a law. One of the states passed a law. I think it was Virginia, that you can uh, get a big fine and some jail time for doing that now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, calling, making a false claim against someone. A false police report, I think, is a felony. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you can go to jail for that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, but that poor guy, he was in. He said, "Why are y'all bothering me?" And he says, suppose I opened up the door to your house and walked in. How would you have felt about that? Yeah. So they were standing there, and they were looking at him, and they were saying, well, you know, we were just checking. Uh, and he said, why were you just checking? Hmm. So, but anyway, that's just, that's another one of those. None of you. None of you what? None of your business. Well, <laughs> and, and, you, and you know what? See, here's, the, here's a flex. Here's, here's a, a, a point there. That those people, when they went back home, they should have looked at themselves and said, "Why did we do that? Why did they tell their neighbors that they were what they were doing so the neighbors <laughs> wouldn't make an idiot of themselves?" Yeah, exactly. Yes. I was going to use another word, but uh, <laughs> improper. And, uh, right. I, I try to, I try to keep the language as clean as I can. However, sometimes I bite my tongue really hard. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I got to tell you, but thank you as as usual. Next week, I'm sure we'll have plenty to talk about because we have the debate coming up. And then next week, we will be just about one week away from the election. And there was a big story out. The biggest antitrust suit in history is on USA versus Google. And uh, it'll be good for everybody because uh, there's some folks that just can't get out on Google because of the algorithms and the way they're set. So keep an eye on that. That ought to be interesting. Yeah, yeah. Every Wednesday night right here with Rudy, folks. Thank you. God bless and be safe. And I'll see you next Wednesday right here for the African Americans. This is WPSL Port St. Lucie.